we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Aaron Alcorn, and I'm the curator of exhibitions here at the History Center. And I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for, for coming and enjoying your lunch here. And I also want to thank those who are joining us on our live webinar. Um, I'm going to make sure that we leave some time at the end for questions. And for those of us joining online, um, just feel free to put some questions into the chat, and then they'll make their way to me. So. Um, so today's talk is part of a series of programs that we've been doing about um, popular music in Central Florida, um, which is supporting the History Center's new exhibit. It's called Figurehead, Music of Mayhem and, and Orlando's Underground. Um, now this exhibit kind of captures the spirit and energy of um, Orlando's underground music scene uh, in the 1980s and 90s, as told through the lens of an independent concert promoter named Figurehead. Um, it's a really fascinating story, and I think a vivid example of how young people can kind of create community. Um, so, but bef I'd like to thank uh, everyone who is involved uh, in the development of the exhibit, um, especially those who share their stories and their stuff, and the in-house team that helped pull everything together. Um, specifically, I want to just go ahead and call attention to a couple of folks, because they work really hard. Uh, especially assistant curator Jeremy Heilman, who took a chance meeting, was able to build it into some massive uh, collection of concert posters, and then crafted the story. Uh, and also to um, Cindy Marathu and Paul uh, Tremblay, who helped create this really beautiful exhibit. Um, I'd also like to thank Pam Schwartz, the um, History Center's executive director, for giving um, us a lot of latitude to try something new. So. Pretty cool. Um, for those who are logging in online, you really need to come and see this exhibit. Um, we're just downtown. Please come. <laughs> All right. But for now, we're going to go ahead and set aside that little plug for the exhibit and underground music um, for the boy band craze. But before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge my friend Catherine, who suggested that I consider a talk on boy bands. And now when I say friend, I mean my boss, and by consider, it, but anyways, it's been, <laughs> it's been so much fun. Um, it's been a, so much fun kind of rediscovering some um, pop music while I was not directly buying the records. They were all over my, um, my youth. Uh, I worked at a, a music store in the 90s, and I sold a lot of Backstreet Boys. So. Well, first we'll start with the new kids. <clears throat> so something strange, we're gonna take you all the way back to 1988, and actually to Tampa, of all places. So something strange was happening in Tampa in 1988. Um, Please Don't Go Girl um, by the new kids in the block had become the most requested song on Q105 radio. It caught everyone by surprise, uh, especially the group's management, uh, which was led by a producer, songwriter, talent wrangler named Marie Starr, and the group's record label, Columbia. Now, the plan was always to use airplay to help eventually sell records, but Q105 was a mainstream pop station. And the strategy had always been um, to f build an audience with um, R&B listeners first, and then move it to the, to the pop mainstream. And this was a really reasoned strategy, and this was one that Starr had used with some success whenever he was breaking the singing group New Edition um, in 1983. It was also one that made a whole lot of sense to the executives at the R&B division at Columbia where that had signed the new kids. There was just one problem. This whole strategy was not working. The black listeners that made up the core of R&B radio just didn't care about the new kids in the block, and certainly not enough to buy their records. The new kids first self-titled LP barely sold 5,000 copies. And the first single, uh, which was released in the spring in advance of 
the record hanging tough, was doing a little better. Columbia was preparing to pull the plug. They were going to shelf the release of the group's second record and send the new kids packing back to Boston. But, as it turned out, there was a program manager at the radio station named Randy uh, Coverage who started playing Please Don't Go Girl, and then Listers responded, and then the, the song went into heavy rotation. Now, this is really the only bright spot before this time, um, since Columbia signed the group in 1986. So they retooled their entire approach to break the group into the mainstream. Um, Columbia's radio team started courting mainstream radio stations in other markets, and the new kids on the block uh, joined Tiffany on tour as an opening act. It was then that things really started to take off. So by 1989, Hanging Tough had sold 8 million copies in the US, more worldwide. Um, and the response to the follow-up release, uh, 1990 Step by Step, was even bigger. Adoring fans would greet them everywhere they went. They were the biggest thing going. And when the band was transformed, and then the band was also transformed into this merchandising juggernaut for t-shirts and all sorts of stuff. So by the end of the year, the new kids in the block had become the highest paid entertainers on the planet. And two years earlier, they were about ready to be sent packing. So, but the new kids in the block and their manager did not create the singing group choreographed dance moves, the teen idol, or any of the other ingredients that would make the group successful. But the new kids in the block became the dividing line between what came before and what came after. Without the new kids, there would be no Backstreet Boys, no NSYNC, possibly no Justin Timberlake. <laughs> and this would be a very short talk on the role of Central Florida in the boy band craze. Now before we move on, uh, you know, pop music really does get a bad rap, uh, particularly when compared to rock and, uh, or hip hop. And I will certainly confess, as I did earlier before we started, that I've occasionally shared those feelings. This is a safe room. Um, it seems that just making music that appeals to the widest possible audience is both its strength and its, its flaw. So, but as long as, as there have been teens, there have been a demand for singing groups featuring young boys, but never were they more popular and in such strong demand than in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. These groups appeared on the scene where Americans were buying more CDs than ever before. And whenever Backstreet Boys and NSYNC dominated the pop charts, they were helping transform pop music. And the fact that they got their start here in Central Florida became an important part of the, of the city's identity. Now prior to this, Orlando's most noteworthy pop culture experts, exports were uh, actors Buddy Epstein and Delta Burke of the TV series, The Beverly Hillbillies and the Designing Women also rock acts like Matchbox 20. But the fact that these young performers were able to move from Central Florida to the world stage is absolutely remarkable. More impressive was that they were able to, they did so while escaping the clutches of their one-time manager, Lou Pearlman, who was really, as we'll see later, a, he, I'm not a fan. So, but how did this happen and why did this happen here? Now, to provide some structure to this talk, I'm going to provide a brief context of pop music uh, in general before I kind of trace the origins of the 1990s story um, here in Central Florida. And I'll conclude by speaking about the very, very, very strange saga of Lou Pearlman and the way he used his influence and public persona as the architect of the boy band craze to pull off one of the biggest financial crimes in history. Now I do this because I, I, and I, I want to just caution this, I do not want to diminish the contributions of the artists. But by the time this story is breaking with Lil, Lil Perlman, um, the Baxter Boys and um, NSYNC had been gifted to the world, so they were out of central Florida. So we'll start first with some, whoops, 
with some definitions. <laughs> All right, so what is a boy band? All right, put simply, a boy band is a male vocal singing and dancing group who perform pop music for an audience of teenage girls. Now, this definition begs some exploration, so please, I'm asking you for a little bit of patience on this slide here, which is entitled, Signs, well, tell you about signs that you might be in a boy band. All members are young males in their teens to early 20s. Pretty simple. You sing pop music marketed at teenage girls. Pretty straightforward. You dance and sing, but almost never play musical instruments in your performances. Your image is carefully managed by a team. You find yourself correcting people. Actually, we're an all-male vocal group. <laughs> the phrase, recoupment of expenses, makes your blood boil. When you look to your left or your right, you can clearly identify personality types. There's the bad boy, the heartthrob, the cute one. And if you don't want to talk about it, there's a good chance you're the shy one. <laughs> So we're going way back. So male singing groups owe their origins to um, barbershop quartets, which first appeared in the late 19th century, and they would ebb and flow in popularity ever since, uh, changing with the time, continually evolving. And like so many musical creations, this style of singing originated uh, first with African Americans, performers, and spread on from there. So at its core, the barbershop quartet are, um, quartets are characterized by a single lead who sings the melody and then uh, with the rest of the members harmonizing to produce a full chord. Now after the Second World War, the singing style was revitalized, paired with choreography and rechristened uh, doo-wop. Among the standout acts here are The Temptations, uh, you can see just there to the right, um, and Frankie Valli and The Four Seasons. So were the Temptations or Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons boy bands? No, they're not teens. <laughs> so what's missing is the key ingredient is, is, is teenagers. Um, so the invention of the teen idol um, goes hand in hand with the invention of the teenager, teenager itself. Now, the teenager is a result of two um, developments. In the late 19th century, um, the discovery, there was a discovery of adolescence. Somehow it was just invented. No one missed it. Everyone missed it before. And then it was the marriage of this idea of an adolescence um, with a growing consumer culture in the early 20th century. So there are huge economic, social, technological, demographic forces at play here, which I'm not going to get into, but I would if you like. Um, but starting in the early 20th century, we see a series of reforms, um, child labor laws, compulsory education legislation, the spread of high schools that help define this gap between young children and the rough and tumble workplace of adults. We have a new thing being created. And it is so, so, so important. Now, department stores and publishers of young adult fiction and periodicals and others stepped in to cultivate this new market. So that by the 1920s, there is a readily identifiable and recognizable teen culture, culture starting to emerge. Omedia, too, is going to play its part in the adulation of young celebrities and musicians followed. So vocalists like Frank Sinatra were all the rage with the Bobby Sox set. And, but also uh, early performers like Elvis um, really cemented this link between popular music and an emerging teen culture. The teen idol was born. Now, Elvis may have opened the door, but the Beatles really charged right through. So Beatlemania helped define what followed and demonstrated the amazing profits uh, that could be gained by cultivating teen idols in their fan bases. Now, the strive to inspire inspire the creation of a steady stream of pop groups in the 1960s and the 70s, including um, 
made-for-TV groups, the Monkey, who were really actors and sort of became a band after, um, the Osmonds, the Jackson Five, um, Scotland's Bay City Rollers, who taught me how to spell Saturday, and of course, Menudo. Now, Menudo was formed by Edgardo Diaz in 1977, and he created this factory-like singing group that treated members like interchangeable parts. Um, the members were employees for Menudo Inc. and were fired when they turned 16 and just replaced by someone younger. Uh, they were all the rage in most Spanish-speaking countries. Um, but over the course of nearly three decades, Menudo cycled through 39 members. Just. All right, so that's our very quick introduction. Um, but before we turn to the boy band phenomenon in Central Florida, allow me to identify two developments that would influence their trajectories. And we're in the 80s now. Uh, the first, starting in 1979 and continuing through the 1980s, and I promise you this is the only kind of slide with bar graphs. <laughs> um, we see a slight increase in the birth rates in the United States. That's kind of identified there, that kind of little bump. Um, if you're a millennial, you're there. So, And the second was the formation of New Edition in 1978. And just to be absolutely clear, abundantly clear, I am not saying that the increasing birth rate was caused by New Edition. <laughs> I'm really... So, here they are, New Edition. So why was New Edition so important? Uh, the group was uh, made, by, made up of Bobby Brown and Michael Bivens, Ricky Bell, and later Ralph Riz Travon and uh, Ronnie DeVoe. Uh, and they were formed in Roxbury, Massachusetts in 1978, as I said. And they performed in school auditoriums and area talent shows until um, in late 1981, they caught the attention of a local music producer named Marie Starr. Um, Star would sign them to a record deal and even pen their first hit, Candy Girl, which, oh, I know. <laughs> we'll just play a little bit here. enough of a sample. Um, all right, so without question, the, de the, the group is completely indebted to the Jackson 5. Without it, I mean, Riz is playing a young Michael Jackson. Um, but what New Edition is really important and significant for is for pairing harmonic vocals with electronic hip hop. So New Edition embarked on, after they released and recorded their first uh, single, the album was released, they embarked on a months long tour in the summer of 83. Um, and upon their return, they were presented with their royalty checks, which was for both the tour and the record sales. Each member received $1.87. <laughs> Now, this paltry sum was explained as a result of recruitment of expenses. So New Edition was kind of pissed, and so they ended up severing ties with Marie Starr and Streetwise Records, and then they would sign with MCA in 84. Um, 
MCA would release a self-titled record um, which brought hits like Cool It Now, a song that has been stuck into my head since I first heard it on a, at a roller rink in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> and Mr. Telephone Man, which I blame for years of misunderstanding how both telephony and relationships worked. <laughs> Now, Maurice Starr would then go on to assemble the New Kids in the Block in 84. Now, New Edition would continue to tour and release records, and, but they also spun off several solo projects um, that would transform R&B music in the 80s. Well, we're moving on. All right, so here's our family tree, sort of. All right, so um, in 85, Bobby Brown left the group. Well, he was invited to leave. Um, um, f and he embarked on an enormously successful solo career. Um, 1989 brought Belle, Biv, DeVoe, which was made up of Belle, Biv, and DeVoe. And um, Michael Bivens uh, actually went on to produce hits for a new edition uh, inspired group from Philadelphia called Boys to Men, uh, which took its name from a new edition song. Now, the, all of these acts ended up popularizing the new jack sound um, in the late 80s. And this is uh, music that blends R&B and jazz and hip hop and electronica with uh, synthetic percussion, um, you know, the drum machines. And this is really gonna uh, drive um, 80s R&B and pop. So the kinds of things I'm thinking about right here, Belle Biv DeVoe, um, the song Poison, where it's like da 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 So, so good. And just about every track on Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation album. Um, but the new edition is also important because they toured with hip hop artists and helped rappers gain access to audiences around the country. So uh, new edition and their offshoots were so influential to shaping the next generation of performers. And it was his love of New Edition that finally convinced a young Joey McIntyre to join the New Kids in the Block. Um, future Backstreet Boys, uh, Kevin Richardson and Brian Luttrell uh, recalled sit performing Boys Men songs at uh, county fairs in Kentucky. So this becomes the sound. Now the connections between New Edition and New Kids are even more pronounced. Um, when Starr was assembling this group, he turned to five white kids who just happened to be attending the same Roxbury public schools uh, that educated New Edition. So by 1989, Hanging Tough had outsold, was only outsold by one other record, and it was actually by Bobby Brown, interesting enough. Um, but a boy band's success was not just in record sales. Uh, it's the combination of merchandise sales and sold out tours that would transform the new kids into an economic juggernaut. So the new kids, merchandising. All right, so the new kids, their faces, they're gonna appear on T-shirts and dolls and shoes and bubblegum trading cars and shoe, shoelaces and jewelry and sleeping bags and bed sheets and books and board games and posters. <sighs> so by 1991, um, the sales of New Kids merchandise generated more than $400 million. And this accounted for nearly half of their total revenue for that year. Yep, there's some pins. I don't know why. It's, uh, they even had their own Saturday morning cartoon, which I'm going to try to play just a tiny bit of it, of just the intro. just a little bit, just a little taste. So every Saturday morning on ABC, this appeared. 
Um, and it followed the adventures of the new kids. Every episode was essentially the same. They were on their way to a tour stop. Um, hijinks ensued. Um, <laughs> some really positive pro-social lessons were created. They make it in time. Everything's cool. They move on. So uh, This only aired for one year on ABC, but then went into heavy rotation on the Disney Channel afterwards. Um, it seemed that the new kids were absolutely everywhere, but the market for their breed of pop songs was starting to cool. And uh, the group eventually called it quits in 1994. But in 10 years, they sold more than 80 million records, which is just stunning. Now, um, in the early 90s, music tastes were changing, and the appeal of boy bands were just really waning. Um, you know, New Jack Swing was all over the radio and MTV, and had begun to chip away at this hard divide between pop and R&B, which um, it's really good. So, um, And meanwhile, there was kind of edgier music that was kind of quickly displacing pop. Um, starting in 91, um, punk and grunge broke following the release of uh, Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. And hip-hop artists like Dr. Dre are offering a much darker and a much kind of grittier view of life than portrayed in the three-minute pop ballad. Uh, you know, the boy band really seemed done. But it wasn't. <laughs> so, and now we're at uh, Orlando. Now, the success of the new kids in the block piqued the interest of Lou Pearlman. Now, Pearlman was a self-made millionaire from New York. Uh, who moved to Orlando in 1989. Um, he made his fortune in the aviation industry, he claimed, um, after he parlayed a ch childhood interest in blimps into a commercial advertising bit business, which was based on the hunch that well-known brands would pay a fortune to feature their logos on his flying ships. So the first few blimps crashed, and they'd crashed by design. It was later found out that this was all a big insurance fraud. Um, but the insurance money would keep him afloat, and his operations eventually attract counted marquee brands like MetLife, McDonald's, and in uh, Orlando, SeaWorld. It was a SeaWorld blimp as well. So he, for a time before he came down to Florida, he dabbled in a helicopter charter business before he launched Transcontinental Airlines, a chartered jet airplane business. By the early 1990s, he started to wonder if he could gain even greater riches by creating a boy band in the, the kind of vein of new kids. So Perlman later claimed that the idea came to him when the new kids chartered one of Transcontinental's jets and he wondered how a group of kids could afford the $250,000 a month he was charging. When he learned how successful the group was, he thought to himself, I can do that. And he decided he was going to form a, you know, assemble a pop group of his own. Of course, absolutely none of this was true. Almost no one can verify that the new kids ever stepped foot on a chartered jet from Transcontinental which makes sense because Transcon didn't own any jets anyway. They were an airline with no, no equipment. The company, it was later discovered, was an empty shell, right down to the doctored photographs of an airplane fleet that didn't exist. They were all handmade models, artfully photographed. And they, his fingers were kind of cropped out of the photographs. Um, and Transcontinental had bogus financial reports, and sadly, the company shares um, that uh, Perlman ended up selling to loads of unsuspecting investors. So, but for those um, who knew Perlman as a child, it seemed he could ne never tell the truth. He lied about everything. Just about the only thing that was true was that Art Far Garf, sorry, cannot believe that, that was a slip right there. Art Garfunkel was his cousin. He was a con man of the highest order, but we're going to get more to that later. So, 
In many respects, Central Florida becomes this perfectly situated place where you can start a pop group. Um, theme parks, film studios, and there were plenty of teenage performers auditioning around town. Orlando was perfect. As one former MTV VJ noted, Orlando actually kind of makes sense. There are a lot of theme parks, there are a lot of young entertainers. It's like Hollywood, but you can afford it. So how does the head of a non-existent airline company go about creating a boy band? Oops, sorry. Missed that one. He placed a classified ad. Uh, so this is a copy of the ad that was released in 1992. Um, and it reads, producer seeks male teen singers that move well <laughs> between 16 to 19 years of age for new kids type singing and dancing group. Now, Perlman and his team held several auditions before they began to find some promising talent. Uh, they found Orlando natives Howie um, Duro, AJ McLean, and eventually Nick Carter. And as it turned out, the three of them knew each other from um, going to local auditions for commercials and theaters and television in the, in the area. So, and they all shared a passion for soul music and R&B and discovered a unique harmony when they were singing together. Now, Perman's team eventually found Kevin Richardson, um, a Disney World cast member, who played the characters Aladdin, a Ninja Turtle, and Goofy. Richard would then, Richardson would then go ahead and enlist his cousin, Brian Luttrell, to uh, be the final member of the group. So the band's name was chosen after our Orlando outdoor flea market, which was called the Backstreet Market, and here's an advertisement for it. Um, it's long gone now, but it had become a popular teen hangout. So in essence, it was a giant parking lot, and so when they weren't doing flea markets, kids would just go there, they'd drive around in their cars, they'd listen to music, they would just hang out. So. All right. So the group was made official on April 20th, 1993. Um, and then the boys would go on to perform their first um, concert within another couple of weeks. Uh, they played at grad night at SeaWorld um, to over 3,000 teenagers. And then they started traveling across Florida where they'd play at shopping malls and charity events and basically just wherever they could go. Um, and this right here is, it's, it's so great. Um, this is a, a, this is a, a backstage interview uh, with the Backstreet Boys in 1993. Here we are with the Backstreet Boys. Hey, what's up? Uh, starting from over here, what's your name, buddy? AJ. Your name? AJ McLean. Hey. AJ McLean. Hey. AJ McLean. Hey. 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 Like Kevin. Kevin who? Howie D. Thank you, see? And uh, what do you guys plan on uh, doing tonight? Uh, how, how many songs have you been singing? Sing two, two and a half. half. Two and a half songs. Two and a half. You guys got to get into it. We don't have much time, so we're going to have to get into it. Okay. Two and a half. I think this was the guy here that they wanted the most. I don't know why. What, the kid was him or what? Was it him or what? Yeah. Think so? Oh, it was Kevin. The girls love him? It was Kevin they wanted? It was Kevin. It was Kevin? Kevin? AJ it was? Uh, you guys... I thought it was my son. <laughs> I think it was me too. Well, all right, all right. You guys are out? He wants you to out, right? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't say much about him, though. I thought. He's the hard guy. He's the hard guy of the bunch. I'm useless. Maybe I'm too. He's the oldest. Okay. Uh, how old are you anyway? Sixteen. And how old are you? Nineteen. Twenty. 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 Such a cute. I wish you guys lots of luck in your business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, they truly were just kids. So, um, to his credit, and I'm not going to give Perlman many breaks, but on this one I will, um, he did add a lot more talent to the team 
Um, he enlisted Johnny Wright and his wife Donna to help develop the, the group. Now, this decision was perhaps uh, as important as the selection of the members of Backstreet itself. Now, Johnny Wright, uh, we can kind of see him just right there in the back, <laughs> uh, was the former tour manager for the New Kids in the Block. And he brought a degree of professionalism to the project. Um, and it was Wright's decision to later ship the Backstreet Boys off to Europe so they could kind of develop their sound. Um, now, um, his wife, um, his wife's background in marketing was also important, as well as her early decision to go ahead and, and try to test out the group by just putting them on a Winnebago and sending them on a tour of middle schools and high schools. So soon after the Backstreet Boys were formed, they entered a phase called boot camp. And now boot camp consisted of tutors in the morning for the school age members, um, followed by six to eight hours of choreography and vocal training in a warehouse that had no air conditioning. There was strength training, working out, um, and then more rehearsals. They worked really, really hard. And to help create a sense of cohesion with the group, the members moved into a band house. And they were given $35 a day as a per diem. Now, all the expenses and meals were covered. They solely existed to work. And they worked like heck to try to build something and come together as a unit. Now, the group did record some demos in Orlando, but the results were not great. Even Kevin admits the music we were making in Orlando was subpar. It was just no good. The songs were good enough for the Backstreet Boys to get a recording contract with Jive Records in 95, but it was later decided that it would be best to send them off to Europe uh, and help the um, group kind of hone their sound, get their act together. So as AJ would remember, at the time, radio was playing Nirvana and Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, and there was no room for boys like us. Now, this decision to go to Europe was so, so, so very important. Um, the Backstreet Boys set off for Stockholm where, um, and the city's famed Chiron Studios. Now, unlike in the US, Europe was completely enthralled with danceable pop music, and Chiron Studios was its absolute center. Um, it was a place where um, pop artists would be linked up with songwriters, sounds were developed, they were recording studios. It was just a hit factory. So um, the studio turned out uh, Ace of Bass, um, uh, and later they delivered hits for the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney Spears, and others. They even managed to uh, revive John Bon Jovi's career with the mega hit, It's My Life. So, so incredibly, incredibly important. Now, the studio would close in 2000, so. But what the Backstreet Boys gained from this was this new kind of hook-laden sound, which blended the R&B tradition that its members really loved uh, with this funky synth pop edge. It was this marriage of kind of R&B and Euro pop. And this was something that was new and it would uh, help the group move into mainstream success. Now this is readily apparent on songs like We've Got It Going On and later Everybody, Backstreet's Back. Now for the next couple of years, the Backstreet Boys rehearsed, performed, toured, and clawed their way to um, up the European pop charts. They're going to gain success in Germany and Austria and Switzerland before they moved to UK, the UK and eventually into Canada. And so they, although the, oddly enough, they were not touching the United States. So they did release uh, a single in the United US, but it just did not go anywhere. Um, and their first CD um, was actually never released in the US, um, nor was the follow up which was called Backstreet's Back, which kind of makes sense because they were never there in the first place. <laughs> um, 
So instead, the, the group's first um, U.S. album was 1997's Backstreet Boys, which was really just made up of singles from the first two releases. Now, after this entire grunge era, sort of a, a sort of a embrace of sort of grittier uh, hip hop, um, things were starting to change uh, back home by 1997. You'll remember we've got that early kind of graph where we've got this birth rate. These kids are starting to become teenagers themselves. So, and um, thanks to the popularity of groups like Spice Girl, the Spice Girls, and Hanson, and so many others, um, Americans kind of rediscovered a taste for pop music. Now, teens went absolutely mad for quit playing games with my heart and um, everybody, which is, it just that synth sound behind it is really great. Um, and the Backstreet Boys quickly climbed the charts. Um, the group was endlessly touring, and in 1998, Orlando's mayor prevented them, uh, presented the group with the keys to the city. So, now, Perlman had reached pop mogul status, um, thanks to the success of the Backstreet Boys, but he wanted more. Uh, once again, Orlando was the perfect uh, source for teen talent. Um, in 95, he spotted um, Chris Kirkpatrick at Universal Studios. He was performing in a doo-wop group. And he pulled him aside after his performance and said, if you can pull together some friends, I will back, the, back what you create. So Kirkpatrick kind of linked up with some people that he knew. He was able to get um, Justin Timberlake, um, J.C. Chazez, where they were both from, um, they were on the Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, he also got Joey Fatone, um, who was another performer at Universal. Uh, later, they were able to convince Lance Bass, who sh actually shared a vocal coach with uh, Timberlake. Um, and he was brought down from Mississippi to provide the lower harmonies and kind of round out this group. So InSync was created and formed officially on October 1st, 1995. Three weeks later, they're performing at Disney's Pleasure Island. But much like the Backstreet Boys, they are eventually sent over to Europe to help kind of cultivate, you know, kind of define their sign, record, um, before the, and they would eventually bring their first album back in 98. So the Backstreet Boys um, first learned about NSYNC in 95, but Perlman completely concealed his involvement in the group's creation. Instead, he actively fueled this intense rivalry between these two groups. Now, only later did Backstreet kind of learn that Perlman was also behind NSYNC, and the sense of betrayal was felt. They could not believe it. Um, they had called Perlman Big Papa, and he, he was really a, almost a fatherly figure. Um, they looked up to him, you know, invited to his house, taken out to lavish dinners, they confided their secrets in, into him. I think the, the, the biggest sense of betrayal was um, Kevin Richardson. You know, after his father died, he just really just needed someone to talk to. So, But Perlman um, really benefit, benefits from this rivalry. And later, he tried to explain away the criticism with the reasoning that once Backstreet Boys were, would become successful, it would only be a matter of time before a copycat group would be created. So why not create it himself? His explanation, and he used the metaphor, it was basically like the 1980s Cola Wars, except that he would own both Coke and Pepsi. Now, in sync, whenever they released their first record in 1998, um, they, they kind of struggled to find an audience. Um, uh, they just couldn't. They were in the shadows of the Backstreet Boys. But they caught their break when the Backstreet Boys turned down a live concert appearance on the Disney Channel just weeks before it was supposed to happen in 98. Um, so they agreed to perform. And after the taping, the concert was broadcast daily on the Disney Channel for weeks. And soon, NSYNC was starting to climb the charts. So 
With two amazingly popular hit groups, it seemed that Perlman had his fingers on the pulse of young America. But trouble was starting to brew between Perlman and the two groups, and money was at the center of things. The problem started with the contracts that Backstreet Boys and NSYNC signed with Lou Perlman. Simply put, the artists were not getting paid, and they were feeling cheated. Um, if you've had a chance to see um, the Lance Bass's um, documentary, The Boy Band Con, you know, has this one sense where he, they tell a story about how at a dinner in 1998, um, the members of NSYNC and all of their families were brought uh, and they were going to be presented with a big check. So, and they were shocked when they were handed a check for just $10,000 each. And this was after three long years and endless touring and selling close to 10 million records. The Backstreet Boys did better, but they had been doing it longer and were selling more records. And so they just were unbelievably unhappy. So now the music business is cruel, but the contracts that both uh, the groups ended up signing committed them to what they would describe as a life of indentured servitude. The struggle was over decreasing percentages of the pie after record labels, venues, songwriters, concert promoters, etc., all took their share. Both the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC faced enormous management fees from Transcon Records, a mountain of recuperable expenses, and an agreement that made Lou Pearlman a member of the group. So he was entitled to a one-sixth share, on top of all the fees that he was collecting. All told, Pearlman was taking nearly 60% of the earnings, and the remainder, after all the recuperable expenses were paid back, was then divided between the rest. There was no money because it was all gone. So all those meals, the band houses, the travel expenses, the per diems, the security, the marketing expenses, all the talent coordinators, choreographers, all the rest of this stuff, all need to be paid back first. So both groups sued to get out of their contracts, and the Backstreet Boys had to pay Perlman um, nearly $30 million to sever their ties, and then they still had to pay him the one-sixth share off of their future earnings. Uh, in sync, settled out of court. After breaking with Perlman, the Backstreet Boys and In Sync enjoyed even greater success. So, um, the Backstreet Boys Millennium um, was released in 1999 um, to amazing anticipation and tour support, and in the first week sold 1.1 million copies. Uh, In Sync's 2000 release, No Strings Attached, which playfully reveled in freedom from Perlman, uh, did even better. It sold 1.2 million copies the first week it was released, uh, thanks to this infectiously catchy hit, Bye Bye Bye. <laughs> Again, you cannot get it. <laughs> so, What's really interesting, I think, for these groups and what's going to be um, um, spell the direction for future success is they're able to avoid this being trapped in this teen mold. Um, and so they start to gain adult list listeners and, and they move solidly into the mainstream of top 40 hits until every time I seem to go to the dentist, I hear it playing in the waiting room. So. <clears throat> Now we're going to turn to Perlman. So as for Perlman, he was not done with his dreams of a boy band empire. And he turned to creating a series of boy bands, including Natural, LFO, Take Five, and a girl group called Innocence, which almost signed Britney Spears. But um, Now each group signed the same terrible contract with the same terrible terms, and they essentially replacing this risky bet in the hope that there would be a chance of frame, uh, fame. Now, none of these groups Perlman would develop after Backstreet Boys and NSYNC would ever get close to their success. I guess he kind of forgot that in the epic battle for market share between Coke and Pepsi, there really isn't much room for RC Cola. 
Now, Perlman would even go on to become a reality, reality show star for a turn, thanks to the ABC MTV show Making the Band, uh, something I remember watching repeatedly whenever my wife and I had our first house while we were sanding the floors. Um, and it was a competition show that featured teens competing to get their big break and joining a band called O-Town. Now, O-Town was also the name of his planned boy band entertainment complex, which was going to be housed in the once thriving um, Church Street Station District. Uh, he relocated Transcon's offices to the complex, which featured an expensive steakhouse and plans for featured live entertainment. Uh, he also added other businesses. He had a big chain of TCBY yogurt stores. He bought the Chippendale Dancers. Um, and then also a modeling agency busy, a business called Options Talent, which was already under investigation for cheating people. But even though he wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day operations with uh, boy bands, he's still cultivating his, you know, taking advantage of his success and luring more investors into his uh, companies, Transcontinental Airlines, Transcon Records, and the parent Transcontinental International. But starting in 2006, investigators started discovering that the entire empire was actually one of the longest running Ponzi schemes in US history. For more than two decades, Perlman had been luring investors with falsified documents, fictitious financial statements, and bogus accounting. He used all this paperwork to secure bank loans, investments from in individuals who lost absolutely everything. All told, the swindle, he, swind, he suspected of swindling hundreds of million do uh, dollars out of people's hands. Now, he eventually tries to get away. He's caught and convicted and sentenced to a 25-year prison term. Although the judge during sentencing said that if you would give $1 million back to the, to the people who were defrauded, he would knock one month off of each, uh, off the sentence. So he didn't pay a thing. Now the trustees and the lenders hoped they would be able to recover money from the sale of his assets and his belongings, but even the mansion that was full of well-known art and memorabilia turned out to be made up of fakes. Everything was a fiction. Uh, Perlman would suffer a stroke in 2010. He remained in poor health before he died in prison in 2016. So what are we supposed to make of Lou Perlman and his contributions here? As his one-time childhood friend recalled after his death, the story of Lou Perlman is a sad one, because here is a man who could have legitimately had it all. He could have paid it all back, but that never crossed his mind. But, on the other hand, he did change history. He changed music history. But I think changing the music industry might be too high a price to pay for all those he cheated. So. See, I'm running out of time, so I'll kind of close here and turn to questions. I do have a question from the web, Aaron. Yes. Travis asks, who is your Mount Rushmore of boy bands? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Travis. Um, hmm. That's a hard one. I, I'm, I'm going to have to go ahead and say in sync. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Someone asked, who is your favorite member of NSYNC and why? <laughs> oh, um, wow. I mean, do you go with Joey because he's funny and goofy? Um, or Justin because he brought sexy back? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It was the 14 year old in the video with the Backstreet Boys. Oh, Nick Carter. Yeah. I know they were so, so young. In, in many ways, 
And I'm not just trying to play to the audience that's sitting right here. It, it, it truly is the fans that help make this, th these yeah. groups um, and allow them to continue to um, tour and support. And even if boy band music is not my personal first go-to thing that I want to listen to, their talent and skill is, is really undeniable and those songs are so catchy. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the resurgence? You know, it was kind of like an England resurgence for a while with your One Direction and now the South Korean, you know, South Korean pop. What do you think of this next wave of boy bands? Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's this thing where as long as you're going to we're going to continue to kind of create an audience for these groups, there are going to be groups to connect with them. Um, but I think it's really important not to um, kind of knock down the fans or, or their, these, the relationship of, between fans and performers is, is really sacred. And, um, you know, this is, they're just getting so much, the, the fans are getting so much out of, out of these groups. Um, there's a point you can imagine being, well, be easier for this group. Um, you can imagine being a, a sort of a young teenage girl just wondering, you're like, it's your first crush. You're like, are you kind of this one? Are you a bit more like this one? Um, but there's also this, this, ba this bonding of sort of a group of fans of all together, this identification of as kind of a core. Um, and this is really foundational stuff for um, carving out your own, uh, you, you know, your own personal identity sort of something that's going to be separated from your parents. So th these are, these kinds of groups and these, these kinds of uh, obsessions are um, so, so important. So, All right, I want to thank everyone for joining today, and we hope you enjoyed the program. We hope to see you soon.